Chapter 19, The Return of Rhyme and Reason. Sailing past three of the tallest peaks and just over the outstretched arms of the grasping demons, they reached the ground and landed with a sudden jolt. Quick, urged Tok, follow me, we have to run for it. With the princesses still on his back, he galloped down the rocky trail and not a moment too soon. For pounding down the mountainside in a cloud of clinging dust and a chorus of chilling shrieks came all the loathsome creatures who chose to live in ignorance and who had waited so very impatiently. Thick black clouds hung heavily overhead as they fled through the darkness, and Milo, looking back for just a moment, could see the awful shapes coming closer and closer, just to the left, and not very far away were the triple demons of compromise. One tall and thin, one short and fat, and the third exactly like the other two. As always, they moved in ominous circles, for if one said, here, the other said, there, and the third agreed perfectly with both of them, and since they were always settling their differences by doing what none of them really wanted, they rarely got anywhere at all, and neither did anyone they met. Jumping clumsily from boulder to boulder and catching hold with his cruel, curving claws was the horrible hopping hind sight, a most unpleasant fellow whose eyes were in the rear and whose rear was out in front. He invariably leaped before he looked and never cared where he was going, as long as he knew why he shouldn't have gone to where he'd been. And, most terrifying of all, directly behind, inching along like a giant soft, uh, like giant soft-shelled snails, with blazing eyes and wet, anxious mouths, came the gorgons of hate and malice leaving a trail of slime behind them and moving much more quickly than you'd think. Faster, shouted Tok. They're closing in. Down from the heights they raced. The humbug with one hand on his hat and the other flailing desperately in the air, Milo running as he'd never run before and the demons just a little bit faster than that. From off on the right, his heavy bulbous body lurching dangerously on the spindly legs which barely supported him came the overbearing know-it-all talking continuously a dismal demon who was mostly mouth he was ready at a moment's notice to offer misinformation on any subject and while he often tumbled heavily it was never he who was hurt but rather the unfortunate person on whom he fell next to him but just a little behind came the gross exaggeration, whose grotesque features and thoroughly unpleasant manners were hideous to see, and whose rows of wicked teeth were made only to mangle the truth. They hunted together and were bad luck to anyone they caught. Riding along on the back of anyone who'd carry him was the threadbare excuse a small pathetic figure whose clothes were worn and tattered and who mumbled the same things again and again in a low but piercing voice well i've been sick but the page was torn out i missed the bus but no one else did it well i've been sick but the page was torn out i missed the bus but no one else did it he looked quite harmless and friendly but once he grabbed on he almost never let go Closer and closer they came, bumping and jolting each other, clawing and snorting in their eager fury. Tox staggered along bravely with rhyme and reason. Milo's lungs now felt ready to burst as he stumbled down the trail, and the humbug was slowly falling behind. Gradually, the path grew broader and more flat as it reached the bottom of the mountain and turned toward wisdom. Ahead lay light and safety, but perhaps just a bit too far away. And down came the demons from everywhere. Frenzied creatures of darkness, lurching wildly. Wildly toward their prey. From off in the rear, the 
terrible trivium and the wobbly gelatinous giant urged them on with glee and pounding forward with a rush came the ugly dilemma snorting and steam and then looking intently for someone to catch on the ends of his long pointed horns while his hooves bit eagerly at the ground the exhausted humbug swayed and tottered on his rubbery legs a look of longing on his anguished face I don't think I can, he gasped as a jagged slash of lightning ripped open the sky and the thunder stole his words. Closer and closer the demons loomed as the desperate chase neared its end. Then, gathering themselves for one final leap, they prepared to engulf first the bug, then the boy, then lastly the dog and his two passengers. They rose as one and suddenly stopped as if frozen in midair, unable to move, staring ahead in terror. Milo slowly raised his weary head, and there in the horizon, for as far as the eye could see, stood the massed armies of wisdom. The sun glistening from their swords and shields and their bright banners slapping proudly in the breeze. For a moment, everything was silent. Then a thousand trumpets sounded. Then a thousand more. And like an ocean wave, the long line of horsemen advanced, slowly at first, then faster and faster, until with a gallop and a shout, which was music to Milo's ears, they swept forward toward the horrified demons. There in the lead was King Azaz, his dad dazzling armor embossed with every letter in the alphabet, and with him the math magician brandishing a freshly sharpened staff. From his tiny wagon, Dr. Discord hurled explosion after explosion to the delight of the soundkeeper, while the busy din collected them almost at once. And in honor of the occasion, Chroma the Great led his orchestra in a stirring display of patriotic colors. Everyone Milo had met during his journey had come to help. The men of the marketplace, the miners of Digitopolis, and all the good people from the valley and the forest. The spelling bee buzzed excitedly overhead, shouting, Charge! C-H-A-R-G-E! Charge! C-H-A-R-G-E! Can be, who, as everyone knew, was as cowardly as can be, came all the way from conclusions to show that he was also as brave. And even Officer Shrift, mounted proudly on a long, low, dashed, galloped grimly along. Cringing with fear, the monsters of ignorance turned in flight and with anguished cries too horrible even ever to forget, returned to the damp, dark places from which they came. The humbug sighed in relief and Milo and the princesses prepared to greet the victorious army. Well done, stated the Duke of Definition, dismounting and grasping Milo's hand warmly. Fine job! Seconded the Minister of Meaning. Good work, added the Count of Connotation. Congratulations, proposed the Earl of Essence. Cheers, recommended the Undersecretary of Understanding. And since that's exactly what everyone felt like doing, that's exactly what everyone did. It's we who should thank Milo, began when the shouting had subsided. But before he could finish, they'd unrolled an enormous scroll. And with a fanfare of trumpets and drums... They stated in order that henceforth and forthwith let it be known by all men that rhyme and reason reign months more in wisdom. That's reign once more in wisdom. The two princesses bowed gratefully and warmly, kissed their brothers, and they all agree that a very fine thing had happened. And furthermore, continued the proclamation, the boy named Milo, the dog known as Tak, and the insect hereafter referred to as the Humbug, are hereby declared to be heroes of the realm. Cheer after cheer filled the air, and even the bug seemed a bit embarrassed at having so much attention paid to him. Therefore, concluded the Duke, in honor of their glorious deed, a royal holiday is declared. Let there be parades through every city 
and a land and a gala carnival of three days duration consisting of jousts, games, feasts, and follies in every city in the land. The five cabinet members then rolled up the large parchment and with many bows and flourishes retired. Swift horsemen carried the news to every corner of the kingdom and as the parade slowly wound its way through the countryside, crowds of people gathered to cheer it along. Garlands of flowers hung from every house and shop and carpeted the streets. Even the air shimmered with excitement and shutters closed for many years were thrown open to let the brilliant sunlight shine through where it hadn't shone in so long. Milo, Tak, and the very subdued humbug sat proudly in the royal carriage with the Zaz, the math magician, and the two princesses, and the parade stretched for miles in both directions. As the cheering continued, Rhyme leaned forward and touched Milo gently on the arm. They're shouting for you, she said with a smile. But I could never have done it, he objected, without everyone else's help. That may be true, said Reason gravely but you had the courage to try and what you can do is often simply a matter of what you will do that's why said azaz there was one very important thing about your quest that we couldn't discuss until you returned i remember said milo eagerly tell me now it was impossible said the king looking at the math magician completely impossible said the math magician looking at the king do you, do, you, do, you, do you mean, stammered the bug, who suddenly felt a bit faint. Yes, indeed, they repeated together. But if we'd told you then, you might not have gone. And since you've discovered so many things are possible, just as long as you don't know they're impossible. And for the remainder of the ride, Milo didn't utter a sound. Finally, when they'd reached a broad, flat plain midway between Dictionopolis and Digitopolis, somewhere to the right of the Valley of Sound and a little to the left of the Forest of Sight, the long line of carriages and horsemen stopped and the great carnival began. Gaily striped tents and pavilions sprang up everywhere as the, wor uh, the workmen scurried about like ants. Within minutes, there were... Race courses and grandstands, sideshows and refreshment booths, gaming fields, Ferris wheels, banners, hunting, and bedlam. Almost without pause. The mathematician provided a continuous display of brilliant fireworks made up of exploding numbers which multiplied and divided with breathtaking results. The colors, of course, were supplied by chroma, and the noise by a deliriously happy Dr. Discord. Thanks to the sound keeper, there was music and laughter, and for very brief moments, even a little silence. Alec Bing set up an enormous telescope and invited everyone to see the other side of the moon. And the humbug wandered through the crowd, accepting congratulations and recounting a great deal his brave exploits, most of which gained immeasurably in the telling. And each evening, just at sunset, a royal banquet was held. There was everything imaginable to eat. King Azaz had ordered a special supply of delicious words and all flavors for those who liked exotic foods and all languages, too. The math magician had provided innumerable platters of division dumplings, which Milo was very careful to avoid for no matter how many you ate. When you finished, there was more on your plate than when you began. And of course, following the meal came songs, epic poems, and speeches in praise of the princesses and the three gallant adventurers who'd rescued them. King Azaz and the math magician pledged that every year at this same time, they would lead their armies to the mountains of ignorance until not one demon remained. And everyone agreed that no finer carnival for no finer reason had ever been held in wisdom. But even things as fine as all that must end sometimes. And late on the, on the afternoon, on the third day, the tents were struck, the pavilions were folded, and everything was packed, ready to leave. It's time to go now, said Reason. For there is much to do, 
and as she spoke, Milo suddenly remembered his home. He wanted very much to go back. Yet somehow, he could not bear the thought of leaving. And so you must say goodbye, said Rhyme, patting him gently on the cheek. To everyone, said Milo unhappily. He looked around slowly at all his friends he'd made, and he looked very hard, so as not to forget any of them for even an instant. But mostly he looked at Tak and the humbug, with whom he'd shared so much. The perils, the, the dangers, the fears, and best of all, the, the victory. Never had anyone had two more steadfast companions. Can't you both come with me? He asked, knowing the answer as he said it. I'm afraid not, old man, replied the bug. I'd like to, but I've arranged a lecture tour which will keep me occupied for years. And they do need a watchdog here, barked Tok, sadly. Milo embraced the bug, who in his most typical fashion was heard to mumble gruffly, Bah! But whose damp eyes told quite a different story. Then and the boy threw his arms around Tok's neck and for just a moment held on very tightly. Thank you for everything you've taught me, said Milo to everyone as a tear rolled down his cheek. And thank you for what you've taught us, said the king. And And as he clasped his hands, clapped them, the, the, little, the little car was brought forward, polished, like new. Milo got in and, with one last look, stared down the road and started down the road, with everyone waving him on. Goodbye, he shouted. Goodbye, I'll be back. Goodbye, shouted his ass. Always remember the importance of words. And numbers added the math magician forcefully. Surely you don't think numbers are as important as words, he heard his as shout from the distance. Is that so? replied the math magician a little more faintly. Why, if... Oh dear, thought Milo, I do hope they don't start it all again. And in a moment, they'd faded from sight as the road dipped, turned, and headed for home. <laughs>